it is a huge honor for me and a thrill to be not just at this conference, but on the stage with these two giants. And I could talk to them for hours, but I know you want to get to lunch. <laughs> so we're only going to talk for about an hour. And we are going to take some audience questions. So as you're listening to them, talk to me. Keep in mind what, um, what you'd most like to ask them. We will only be able to take a couple of questions. And I think we'll probably do what we were doing in the earlier sessions and have a mic down here. Um, so let's start. Thank you both for doing this. Um, over the past 24 hours, yesterday afternoon and this morning, we heard a lot of granularity about what digital disease detection can do. But to start us off, I'd really appreciate it if you could each sort of take a step back and talk about what you think of as kind of the big promise of digital disease detection. What, what's kind of your, your blue sky hope for what it, it might manage? Larry, let's start with you. Thank you very much. Um, Mark, thank you, John. Thank you, uh, the Jesuits. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's really great. Listening to all of you the last uh, day and a half is as good a uh, sampling as we could have of the promise of this new field. Um, you know, I, I was very fortunate that I was there as uh, TCP I, I, IP was created and the internet began. I got to see the last case of smallpox. And this has that kind of buzz about it. It, it feels like we're all here as witnesses to a birth of a new science. Well, I don't mean a new science like physics or chemistry, maybe just a little science, but a little science that has a tremendous possibility. And uh, I wanted to demonstrate the power of participatory surveillance. Uh, many of you asked me if this were a fireside chat, where was the, here's the experiment. <laughs> right? So you asked for it, and we did it. That's the power of participatory surveillance. Um, um, I have tremendous hopes for this. Um, I'm, of course, interested in one of the verticals, preventing pandemics. There are all these horizontals, reducing suffering, eliminating disease, decreasing the cost of medical care, all the non-medical social goods. Those are the horizontals that might come from this. I come out of the world of verticals, smallpox eradication, polio eradication, blindness work, and the vertical that I'm interested in is preventing pandemics. Here's the big picture for me. I think that there are two trains, they're rushing in opposite directions. One of them is the train of modernity. It's increasing population, increasing and unwise resource consumption. It's increasing disparity between the rich and the poor. It's increasing consumption of animals. It's humans living in animals' territory. Increasing consumption of bushmeat. All those other factors that make it not merely likely, but certain that there will be another pandemic of catastrophic proportions. And then here, the little train that could is all the work that's going on now, point of care diagnostics, novel forms of governance, improving general public health, and amongst them, digital surveillance, participatory surveillance. So that's my big picture, is that even though it's only one of the verticals, there's lots of horizontals, we can prevent pandemics. We will prevent pandemics. Is there anyone who seriously thinks 100 years from now we won't have figured this out? The question isn't if it'll be 100 years from now. The question is if we can dial that back so that we can end pandemics in our lifetime. And I think that the tools that you folks are developing, that you're presenting here, um, I think that this is an opportunity for us to move that needle. So that's m my big picture. And it's just, Anne-Marie, it's just Anne -Marie, a delight to be here with you. Wow, that's a big picture. <laughs> Uh, well, as I think about this, I have been to a couple of digital disease detection uh, conferences, and each time the science is getting more more developed, the rigor is there, and the imagination is just um, just amazing. I guess from where I sit, I would very much like to see. <laughs> I knew this was a religious kind of. <laughs> 
I gotta be careful what I say up here, huh? Uh, actually, I should say that I'm not representing the foundation in anything I do say. I'm representing Anne Marie Kimball, so go away. <laughs> Can she go on now, Bill? Um, from where I sit, I'd really like to see us understand a lot more about infectious diseases that inflict, you know, inflict so much suffering on the very poorest people in the world. And so from where I sit, I'd like to see the outreach of this kind of early detection linked with effective response in places where it isn't right now. Um, I think there's been a, a tremendous revolution with the access to communications. But you have to remember that, that leapfrogging with cell phones happened where governments for years had not provided services because there was broken government and there was no desire to serve the very poorest of people. So I think we have a unique opportunity with some of the digital, you know, new digital means to really serve the very poorest people, but we have to be very conscious of moving them out and collaborating. I saw Ed talking on the panel, and Ed does such a wonderful job of working in the very poorest areas of the world, but really collaboratively, and I think that's the key to me. Um, for years at the university, I directed a research and training program in informatics um, with colleagues from Peru, and the level of imagination and uh, ingenuity uh, among some of the very poorest parts of the world uh, it's just, it's astonishing and we cannot afford to pile ahead thinking we're the smartest people in the world. We really have to work hand in glove with the people that we're trying to serve. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I was remembering as I was watching the, the fantastic video about this project in Thailand, um, talking to some of the early smallpox warriors who said that whenever they went into a new village, they were describing the situation in Bangladesh, I think, um, the first thing they would do would be talk to the 10-year-old boys, because the 10-year-old boys knew everything that happened in the village, and they could take you to every single house where someone had had spots. And they know everything about that person and everything about the family. And as I watched that video, I thought, what if those boys had had cell phones? Yeah. How different would that have been? And, I, and it sounds like that's the promise that you envision, that if that these technologies, especially interdigitated, will really allow a leftward shift of a pandemic epidemic curve and maybe even also allow flattening of the curve. If you could get it, can you envision getting this down to, I don't know, one or two reproductive cycles in, instead of, you know, as you say, we go, we've gone from six months of detection to maybe a month now, but can we get it down to days? I, I think so. I mean, it, it, it depends on what what disease we're talking about, if we're talking about flu and it's just a couple of days, that's, that's pretty tough, of course. But if you're talking about something in the smallpox around two weeks or something like that. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm recalling how many innovations of early detection have come out of the smallpox program and the polio program. Mm -hmm. And even right now, because my wife Geert is right in front of me, I'm, I'm recalling that in the smallpox program, when Bill Gates and, and Bill Fagy came, with the idea of surveillance and containment. There was no real reason to do surveillance if you were going to do mass vaccination. The only reason to do surveillance and then active search and house-to-house -house search was because you'd find a case and then you'd have a response that was valuable. And even that wasn't fast enough, and we started looking at unorthodox ways of doing surveillance. And in India, uh, smallpox is revered as a deity, Shitalama, and sometimes people would keep uh, uh, cases in their house and hide them. So even a house-to-house -house search might not find them. And they would go then and visit the Shitalama temple. And my wife, Girja, uh, said, why don't we go to the Shitalama temple before they do and see who's going to come and then talk to them and see if there's cases in their homes. And that was one of the earliest of the earliest. That really was almost two steps to the left on the epi curve because there may have been only one or two cases of uh, smallpox, but you'd find out about the whole community that shared the, the village market or the temple. Um, and I think that in polio, I've been so amazed at the innovation of the combination of digital surveillance and genomic surveillance. And that you probably all heard or read that um, polio virus has been found in the sewage systems in Cairo and in Israel. What's really interesting to me is that those viruses in 
feces have been traced back to Pakistan. So we actually know the birthplace of the virus, which is in the sewage. We wouldn't have known that if we didn't have an active polio eradication program. And what was the response in Israel and in Egypt? Vaccination programs. So you've got early detection, genomic validation, backward tracing, and then a, a, an, an actual response and vaccination. I think that's fantastic. And I think that with all the things we're seeing here in the last couple of days, these are the innovations that will increase the speed with which we move the epi curve two steps to the left, especially One Health, especially animal surveillance. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably like to piggyback a little bit on your polio, um, just to mention that we also have a global database on polio, which includes genomic information on every virus that has been isolated in the world. But to get there, the biggest problem was not the technology. Yeah. The biggest problem was getting information sharing and information flow from partners. And uh, even now it has very limited access. Mm -hmm. And I think that the sociology of this is going to be something that will catch up to us. We're going to have to really work on human relations and collaborative relationships and respect mm -hmm. as we have these new tools that we want to use. Um, and I think the polio situation really exemplified that because here you have a global pandemic emergency, every single voice in the world saying we can do this, we can eradicate this disease, um, and yet you had people who didn't want to share information in the effort. And I think that we need to keep that in mind. Because you've raised the issue of information sharing, I have to in return raise the issue of Middle Eastern coronavirus, which has been mentioned a couple of times in the past two days. And the concern that's obviously felt in some quarters that while the Saudi Ministry of Health in particular is reporting cases, um, perhaps they're not reporting cases as quickly as might be wished, whether that's deliberate or whether that's just a function of how their internal data collection is happening. So. I guess my question in response to that is, do you envision that the sort of informal data collection, uh, unofficial sources, will, can trump any um, lag in official reporting by uh, official sources in countries in a way that's really going to make a difference going forward? I do think there's a tendency informally when there's trust that has been built. And we've seen this with some of the informal networking that's gone on in the Mekong Basin. I know we have some representatives here from MBDS and uh, in other sub-regional informal networks. Because when you have trust, people will disclose and solve problems in common. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's not only a technology fix, um, but if we can build that kind of trust with these kinds of new communication platforms and being more and more connected, then I think we will be able to trump that uh, tendency to hide. Mm -hmm. But out of your experience with smallpox, the, um, d does the problem of stigma of, of a, a disease being associated with a country ever really go away? Oh, I think so. I mean, I think, uh, um, I, I think the way the Chinese are responding to uh, H7N9 is uh, uh, so laudatory and so remarkable. If you think that it was GFIN and ProMed that detected uh, SARS, uh, and that the, the Chinese government was so concerned about loss of tourism or, or whatever the reasons were, um, it, 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 their response right now is to be so zealous in the way that they do surveillance that it really raises an interesting question. I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on this. That if your surveillance is good enough, can um, active surveillance actually act to smother what otherwise would have been a larger pandemic, even if you don't have tools like vaccines and antivirals? Because as I look at the data coming out of China, it, you know, that's one possible explanation for the disease pattern that you have. And I would also say that in, in, in Saudi Arabia, again, um, it was ProMed and a report to ProMed, uh, I presume using email, let's not forget how important email is, but it was a report to ProMed that led to much of the information that we have. In each of those two cases of SARS and in the case of uh, this other coronavirus, uh, these uh, digital surveillance networks, they, they act as sort of a counterbalance to routine governmental reporting and therefore they, they became an incentive for the whole reorganization of the international health regs. 
So we, I kind of like the balance that's emerging now, and I think it's a very, very positive trend. I think China learned a terrific lesson with SARS, at least my colleagues there tell me so. And uh, in looking at their CDAR system, which is a, a web-based system that goes all the way down to the district level throughout um, that very large country, it's really very impressive the level of uh, rapid response and investigation that the PRC has put in place following SARS. So I think, uh, I think they really learned a lesson. and. And I also think they're probably leading right now uh, in, in applying technology to uh, early detection and uh, early outbreak investigation. Um, and that would include the United States. Absolutely. <laughs> Yesterday, we had a great presentation uh, looking at the delta in time between WIBO, which is a microblogging site like Twitter, and the official government um, report. And it was 0.55 uh, hours, which I presume is about 30 minutes. Right, and that's ridiculous. We couldn't do anything close to that. We'd be lucky to get you know 30 hours, or maybe in history 30 days. So that's a remarkable convergence of the informal network and the formal network. And I think as those numbers come closer and closer together, they really uh, they are the definition of what transparency is. I would also point out that it's all named reporting. So if you're in Beijing, you know exactly which family has what, which may not be quite as acceptable in the United States. Mm -hmm. So because you mentioned sino um, I, I was astonished looking at some of the presentations by the ethicists yesterday about how much people are disclosing about themselves uh, on these networks that we're tapping for this very valuable data. And so since we've just been talking about information sharing on the part of governments, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, either deliberate or inadvertent information sharing on the part of individuals. We benefit from it as a, a movement toward big data, but are we asking people or, or taking advantage of people's ignorance um, in how uh, allowing their information to be made public? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Okay. No, you, no, you take a stab. Rather, you take a stab. Uh, okay. <laughs> Mark mentioned reading down the see. What's that? Hey, roadies. <laughs> How are we doing? Good. Give it a try. Okay. Well, Mark mentioned we were down at Singularity University together, and we were teaching a, a crew of postgraduate students who, from all over the world. And uh, we all did 23 and Me. And um, the next question was, where do we post this? We want to share this as a community. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> So I really do think that uh, this generation, if you will, has much different expectations of information sharing, of privacy, much more transparent than uh, perhaps some of us a little more advanced in age. <laughs> I, I, have, um, uh, I have a theory, if I could, um, as long as Scott Lane isn't going to ding me because he said creativity was malpractice. So if I can give you a kind of creative interpretation. I think that if we go forward a couple hundred years in history and we look back, there'll be about a 200 year bump, maybe two centuries, in which all information was not, pri not available. And maybe right after the beginning of the industrial age until the beginning of the internet. Because before that, when we lived mostly in villages and we were a hundred houses clustered around a river or a well, Everybody knew who was doing what at 2 a.m. in the morning, right? That was the issue yesterday, that you, didn't, you wanted to be able to have some amount of privacy, where you went to school, what your grades were, who the real father of that child was, what you ate for lunch, how many times you were out running. There, were, there was no such thing as this westernized notion of privacy and the way we think now of data confidentiality. I, I think. We've had that for 200 years. I'm not so sure that sociologists would say that the anonymity of the cities has been particularly helpful on issues like crime and um, so many other transgressions against the natural order. I think now that process is be getting to be reversed. It's going to be harder and harder to be anonymous. I think there's pluses and minuses. I think we're only focusing on the negative part of the disclosure of data 
admittedly, sometimes against people's will, without their understanding, without their consent. But I think this is going to be a really interesting thing to watch over time and to see where it goes. Um, I certainly, when I was at Google, and we worried a great deal about privacy, it was the possible good that could come out of anonymization and aggregation of data that kind of fueled the, the, uh, the <coughs> ardor of people who said that the privacy rules have got to be looked at in a much more holistic way. And I still think that's true, but I also recognize you know, some of the things we saw yesterday, being able to predict um, who during their pregnancy is likely to become depressed. There was, there was a yick quality to that that made me feel like we'd gone too far. So I just think this is brand new. We have a lot to learn, and it's going to be uh, really important to, to watch and see what's happened. You know, I think the, the biggest hurdle to influenza early detection is not actually in the human. I think the biggest hurdle to influenza detection is the lack of disclosure by industry, yeah. um, where you have lots of animals aggregated, very close quarters, and you're generating new influenza viruses, either in pigs or in chickens. Um, but those are not disclosed as early warning signals. They're not disclosed to the government. There's all kinds of incentives not to disclose. Um, but I think that's really where we need to begin to think, if we're serious about influenza pr uh, prevention and prediction, is we need to really work with, uh, with our colleagues in those industries to try and create an understanding of that risk, an ownership of that risk, and some way to manage it proactively. Um, I'm in complete agreement. I mean, my, my own current favorite topic of antibiotic resistance. We have so much better surveillance of what's emerging on the human side than we do on the agricultural side. And it's a great challenge to figure out how to bring a really one health understanding of that threat to, uh, to resistance that's largely commercially, and sorry, I mean here, um, not, and not uh, bacterial resistance, but um, refusal to join in that's really economically based. Um, so we were talking a few minutes ago about the, you know, looking back at big past eradication efforts. And you said, Larry, that uh, you, you raised the issue of verticals, of vertical efforts. And I think that's so interesting to think about in the context of big data. Because here we are gathering this data in really a very horizontal manner now, which means that we may have a better sense of what the situation is but there may no longer be such easily identified actors to, take, uh, to, to do something about the situational awareness that we gain. Do, do you have any concerns about that or any feeling of who's going to step forward and act on this data? I, I, think, I think you need vertical programs and you need horizontal implementations. I think you need uh, bottoms up creativity and you also need top down prioritization. And there's a great Greek word, teleological, purposeful. Uh, uh, all the research that's done that creates quaint new forms of surveillance, it's not as valuable if it's not in the context of a program. And while I think we've watched in WHO a tug of war over the last 30 years between vertical programs like malaria, smallpox, horizontal efforts like Health for All, primary health care, felchers, barefoot doctors, this tug of war goes on and on. I think it'll always be with us. I think that if you look honestly at this, um, vertical programs are usually command and control. They're frequently driven by countries that are not actually the countries in which the programs are operated for reasons of the negative externalities of diseases in a global sense. And there's a lot of, a lot of things about ver vertical programs that suck up resources from a government and make it impossible to deliver basic health care. On the other side, the innovations usually come from top-down vertical programs, not always. And the way in which those programs create examples that inspire us. Uh, Nathan said that the smallpox eradication program was a, an inspirational success. It was. Many of us either were in it, we watched it, we went to school because of it. If polio when polio eradication is successful, There'll be another generation 
of people who are inspired. If we lose in polio eradication, there'll be another generation who will be depressed in global health. We need these inspirational examples. And so you need both of these things. I'm worried about a vertical program command and control that doesn't listen to grassroots experimentation. I'm worried about grassroots experimentation that doesn't have its focus in deliverables that are really for the good of the public health. Mm -hmm. Emily, what do you think? <clears throat> I like the discussion of verticals and horizontals, and I do agree that there's going to continue to be this tension between them, uh, especially at WHO. But really the first um, vertical program was the EPI program that really made a huge difference. And, and that was run extremely vertically by WHO. But the advantage was you ha ha actually had a measure. So you could kind of follow the metrics of success. And um, I worked in West Africa setting up some of the early, actually the first three immunization zones w that were set up on the continent. And it was amazing to watch the power of that information with the mid-level managers who were actually giving the immunizations. I mean, to have the access at that level to their own performance metric. You know, this is where I work, and I've got no more measles or whatever. You know, it was just, it was powerful. It was very powerful. We followed coverage. And I think that's really a very, um, a very, positive information loop, when you can put the, in the hands of the people who actually deliver the information about the difference they're making, it's an incredible motivator. I think that one of the reasons that people are here, and certainly I feel this in the room, is that um, the joy of innovation, that the, the energy that people get out of coming up with all these fantastic new things. Um, and, and one of the things that, you know, if you talk to people in the in Silicon Valley, people in the maker movement, they, they'll, you'll hear fairly quickly that you have to be ready to fail. And that it's not a bad thing to fail because failure teaches you so much. But, but in public health in particular, um, our, our, the stakes are so high um, and our goals feel so important that failure in public health doesn't feel like an option. And, and so I wonder, is it possible at this point to talk openly about things that haven't worked? or about being willing to, um, to, to be ready to have things not work in order to make these projects eventually work better? Well, I think, I, would anybody in the room think that the 1950s effort to eradicate malaria was successful? Um, I mean, we've had, we've had global programs that have not succeeded. And I think it's really important to, to look at those very carefully and understand why. And sometimes we just didn't have the right medicines, we didn't have the right whatever uh, tools to make something like that work. Um, but understanding what you didn't have so that you can have it next time, I think is, is very critical. And I also would harken back to something Larry said, and that is that top-down programs are often driven from countries as a way of mitigating their own risk of disease X, which doesn't live in their country, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that observation is important to keep in mind because often the most successful programs are the ones that really, really answer the needs of the populations that you're trying to serve, as opposed to a population that isn't actually at risk of the problem. Well, I think by definition, any eradication program will have a, a final country or a final region and still has it. And for that country, that disease will probably be one of the least important diseases that they're facing. And it'll be more important for the rest of the world, which should logically become the third party payer for that system. And, and sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't work. And the whole idea of eradication, uh, we, we shouldn't get too much in love with it. It, it, it is the limitation of the special cases. I hope it's more than one case, but it, it's never going to be every case. Um, you know, in the United States, we have this wonderful uh, system which has evolved where we use the states as laboratories. And the states use counties as laboratories, especially in public health. And the smaller the community and the more the grassroots the effort, the more creativity you'll have and the more likely things are to fail. We need to embrace that spirit of uh, failure. Um, we've got a couple of venture capitalists sitting in the front row, they're very dear friends of mine, they won't bite. They will probably tell you that they are hesitant to invest 
in an entrepreneur who has not failed. Much rather that investors, that, that entrepreneur's failure be funded by somebody earlier <laughs> than by them. And, you know, there's a limit. You don't want somebody who's had 10 failures in a row unless you're, you know, a mathematician. You think the odds change. Um, but you, you also don't want somebody who's never experienced difficulties because they won't know how to deal with them and they'll come up on, on your nickel. And they'll be increasingly more visible and more important. So we need to have a culture, especially in public health, where we embrace failure, but we limit it by doing our experiments in places that don't have such disastrous effects. If you're dealing with bioweapons research and creating prevention, I don't think that's a good place to have your first failure. <laughs> so after lunch, we're, the, the conference is going to dive back again into granularity and into looking at particular programs. So a uh, wrap-up question. Is there, is there any any sort of big message, anything to keep in mind, any motto, any rubric that you want people to take with them as they kind of move forward uh, into a, another year of exploring the possibilities of this movement and, until we all meet again? I've been thinking about that since our first conversation. And um, I guess what I, what I find kind of interesting is that the more connected we're getting, the more hope we have at limiting contagion. So that doesn't, you know, that's sort of a, an interesting combination of what we're doing here. Um, I guess the other message that I would take away from this is we're not, we're not limited by our technology. We're limited by what's between our ears and also by our hearts. And I think if we can bring those, those best of human qualities into our discussions in a systematic fashion, we can really be really be successful. It's lovely. Larry. I love that. I love what you just said. <laughs> I think today, sitting here in this room, um, if, if I were starting anew, you know, my career was just beginning right now, um, I'd be drinking from a fire hose, like many of you are, because you've got some of the best genomic researchers, you've got some of the best engineering um, practitioners and you've got some of the top statistical epidemiologists. Those three elements, great epidemiology, great engineering, great genomics, I think we will find amazingly wonderful outcomes for the health of the public that will come out of that convergence. And it's really an honor for me to be here and to watch you. I, I get the pleasure of sitting here in the front, so does Anne-Marie. We see all these bright eyes shining at us. and. Uh, all throughout this conference, you get the sense of that, as you say, that spirit of adventure and that spirit of creativity. I think these three things, genomics, epidemiology, and engineering, uh, blend together uniquely here at this meeting. And it's just, it's wonderful to be here at the birth of this, this new science. Thank you both. OK, your turn. Questions from the audience. I do not actually see a mic here, so you may have to just jump up and, or maybe come down to the front of the stage. And if you're not loud enough, I'll repeat the question. <laughs> come on. Is there a microphone? Um, I d are we getting a mic? The, someone is, uh, Anna is pointing. Oh. If you stand over here, I can bring this in. Thank you, Mark. Um, going back to the idea of disclosing your health data, do you think it's an issue of consumers now, people who are used to using technology and using Facebook and Foursquare, they're just kind of used to exposing everything that they do and it's sort of an issue with education and people aren't being educated on the fact that if you disclose one data point about say, like mental health data, that could be utilized by another individual and extrapolated out and have like pretty severe consequences. I'm thinking specifically about employers having access to health data, potentially. Um, so is there like an educational component that just isn't happening right now? You know, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I'm thinking about Indonesia, which is where it's actually the most Facebooked place on the planet. Um, and, they, and I'm wondering about the difference in cultural disclosure sort of practices. Um, it could be naivete, 
uh, maybe maybe the younger generation doesn't understand just how bad it can get <laughs> when uh, when information is disclosed uh, to the wrong people. Um, but I don't know. Uh, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Idealistically, one would like to say it's just because there's so much more community mm -hmm. um, and it's all going to be great in the future. So let's hope for that. <laughs> More questions? Yes, please. Hi, Angus Thompson from uh, Sanofi Pasteur. I just wanted to throw one more thing in the mix. I liked, I liked what you said, Larry, that, that we're looking at the convergence of um, great epi, great engineering, great genomics. But disease is not only about the behavior of the, of the microbes, of the viruses. Disease is about human behavior as well. And one thing I want to throw into this mix, into this meeting, and we're going to touch on this in the workshop this afternoon, is there's also great behavioral science being done now. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure how it integrates with what we're talking about here, but I think it's something we need to bear in mind. Because if we're going to be controlling diseases, a huge component of that is, is human behavior. Um, I certainly agree. And uh, the advances in cognitive sciences are, are breathtaking. <coughs> I do think some of the problems that we're seeing with um, uh, the question of privacy on the internet and this question that lingers in the balance that young people will disclose something or make an information error and then have regret. I don't think that's, that's nothing new. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, went to high school with uh, young men or women who had tattoos put on their shoulder which says, I love Mary or John forever. Um, you know, at some time there'll be an explanation that'll be necessary for that tattoo. <laughs> This is not new, um, and I, d I don't think it's fair to blame that on um, either a failure of cognitive science or individual cognition or the, the technology. I think there's some things about human behavior that are, you know, they've been with us for a very long time. Um, I have a good friend, Dan Goldman, who uh, created the, this notion of emotional intelligence, or EQ, and he has just put out a book, and I think it comes out next week, not to give him too big a plug, but it's, it's about um, what he calls systems blindness. The, uh, you know, the, and I think this is right out of behavioral research. That we do really good looking at the corner of our eye for that saber-toothed tiger that may want to eat us. We do really bad looking for something that's not going to have its effect for three months or three years or 30 years. And you get blind to the whole system because you have fast-moving variables and slow-moving variables. I think we have that very much in what we're talking about now, whether it's a tattoo that you'll regret 20 years from now, something you put on Facebook that you'll have later, or even the whole way that we deal with uh, um, prioritization of different diseases. But I think you're absolutely right. I, I should have added a fourth science. It never occurred to me. Just, just to that last point, I just wonder, I just, just, I, I'd like to know whether when we get the public to participate in epidemiology, will we be having an impact on their behavior? Because you know, we know with vaccination that people are less and less fearful of the disease, and yet we continue to communicate on the, on the, the terrors of the diseases that, that we're preventing. Will they somehow develop a different relationship with diseases when they're involved in the process of reporting, of detecting, and so on? I, it's, I think just, we, it's just a question. I think we just heard uh, earlier today with influenza that the very act of participating uh, as putting your data into influenza net has been shown to increase the, uh, uh, the rate of vaccine coverage. And so I think those intera interactive variables are likely to occur. But along that line, I do think the one missing piece in some of the participatory epidemiology that I've heard about is what do you actually want people to do? What's the response that you're looking for? Because I think the more clear we can be about that and envisioning that, the more effective it will be as a public health tool. Love this session and the fireside, all of you. Uh, one of the one of the interests I have. He was in the same EIS batch as the two of us, so there's a cohort effect here. Yeah, yes, I, I have to, that's my conflict of interest. I would just like to say that was not my EIS. <laughs> um, we're not. Anyhow, my, my question is this, and I, I'm I'm fascinated by the. Um, attention that influenza has gotten and some of the rare diseases in part because they have this short incubation period exactly what you were starting to deal with Larry and I see out in the world 
for instance, this epidemic of HPV, uh, which is an infectious disease, so it should be in this uh, discussion perhaps, where the incubation period is 20 to 30 years. And because we use disease as opposed to a bio, uh, biological marker, we can't get people as excited about getting infected uh, uh, immediately as we can with flu. And certainly for HPV, the consequences in terms of cancer are far in excess of what they would be for the influenza. So I don't know how you make that shift, uh, uh, a paradigm shift, if you will, or move people from a fear of disease to a recognition of infection, which might, might, uh, might be useful. Also, how you might use digital media to get people on campuses. I mean, the statistic in the US is that 50% of college age women are infected by two years after sexual debut. So it's a huge national problem and global problem. Is there some way we could use these, uh, the foothold that you have in digital detection for influenza to get uh, young people more engaged with the uh, protection against an HPV infection. That's something that's real. It kills a half a million people globally. It's a huge problem on an annual basis that's an infectious disease problem that we uh, should well address. And we barely talked about the chronic disease side of this at all, so either of you, please. Well, I couldn't agree with you more about HPV, and I think it's a particular tragedy um, in poor countries because it is the major cause of, of cancer in women and uh, completely without diagnosis and treatment options. So it's extremely important. Um, as far as how you use digital media to address it, that's an excellent question. Um, I think in thinking about that setting, one would want to understand how digital media is available and how it's being used, especially in networks of women, to promote uh, vaccination. There's a tremendous um, difficulty with the HPV vaccination, as you know, because it, it's to be focused on adolescence. And for some reason, when you start talking about HPV, people conflate it with sex. And you know, we have to be one of the most irrational people about sex that, that exist on the planet and so you find in, in a sort of strange conservatism, no I don't want to protect my daughter from cancer yeah. because it has something to do with sex. It's just, it's just, so I don't know exactly how you address that um, but I, I guess I would try and work through networks of women and how they already are communicating and also work with the decision makers. But Anne Reese, certainly the group of young people who are at, at greatest risk of HPV are the same, exactly the same people that would be most frequent users of digital media. And if we could figure out through this network and through this activity how to access uh, these people with a stigmatizing uh, issue like this, we could really do great things for prevention of, of uh, this I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think, I think Roger, you're, you're on to, you know, like almost a, a, a new kind of digital category. I mean, when, when Amory was talking about uh, 23 and me, um, and the, the response of so many of the people at Singularity University, that they wanted to broadcast their whole genome to the extent that they could, for the most part, they're broadcasting very, very early markers, conditions that increase odds ratios, fractional ideological ideological fraction at best. Disease is on the other spectrum. Serial conversions somewhere in the middle. And we don't really publish the results of serial conversion. We don't do as ma many. I mean, look at the problem we have conflating AIDS with HIV positive. I mean, society as a whole has totally conflated it so much that we've had to marry the two three-digit words. So it's HIV and AIDS. So we've conflated that. We don't do really good. But if we did epidemiological, serological conversion studies, and if people began to have that as one of the things that they owned about themselves, of course it would reduce the chance of spreading the disease, but it would also open up opportunities perhaps for interdicting the progression of the disease more than if we didn't even know what the, the base of the pyramid was. I, I think it's a really important point. Natalia Mantilla from uh, Participatory Surveillance System in Mexico. Um, so 
one of the resistances that this kind of system finds is also like in the authorities, which um, maybe for economic reasons um, think that having an additional means of surveilling a, a disease um, may have consequences that they cannot foresee and they don't want to have. So I don't know how you would um, address this sort of, uh, of problem of, you know, how do you, as a participatory surveillance system, um, manage to overcome this kind of resistance? Is there a way in which you can see this happening? Could, could I just ask a yeah, clarification? I, yeah, I'm not really clear what the... Well, are you talking about the, the government being involved? Yeah, I'm talking about the government not wanting, wanting these kind of systems uh, to exist because they, they provide information uh, to the audience that may be not what they want, to, want them to know. Yeah? Mm. So what you're saying is governments not wanting their own populations as opposed to governments not wanting the information out beyond their borders. Um, actually, in both directions, right? Because uh, as you were mentioning earlier uh, with the Saudi uh, coronavirus, um, if you have a sort of participatory surveillance in that, uh, in that country, and it was better known the presence of the, of the virus, and I don't know, I mean, it's something that maybe the authorities wouldn't like as much, because then, uh, you know, outside their borders and also inside, uh, they may face issues that they don't know how to handle. So when we were speaking about doing this chat, Anne-Marie, you said something that has stuck in my mind ever since, which is that the, the, an inevitable consequence of gathering this data is enfranchising human rights, that the more information people have, the, the more they are enriched. Can, so perhaps you can address this in that frame? Well, I do believe that because I think it's, you know, it's usually the least enfranchised individuals who are at the highest risk of infectious disease fairly independently of where you live. If you look at the modeling that's been done for an influenza pandemic, it certainly hits um, the poorest of the poor harder than it would hit the more affluent. So in gathering this information, you do uh, if you use it responsibly, then you can intervene and prevent that kind of uh, problem. As far as the question, I, I'm, I'm still struggling just a little bit, but I think what I hear you saying is that the authorities uh, feel threatened by a participatory epidemiology system, and I think that's true. Um, I think there's some skepticism because false information or rumor can also cause panic. And the one thing in public health nobody likes is panic. No. Um, we learn about it from very early on, and so that may be a piece of the skepticism. And I think the, that also ties into another sort of susceptibility that, that some of these systems have, and that is sort of the false pandemic, um, the deliberate manipulation of information uh, for bad purposes, um, which we are increasingly also at risk. So it's not bioterrorism, it's sort of pseudo-bioterrorism <laughs> with the ability to create the appearance of a pandemic and panic um, being, being deliberate manipulation. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I can see why authorities would to some extent feel threatened by a broader system. At the same token, I think the value potentially is probably uh, far outweighing threat. So keep doing it. <laughs> So we're going to take one more question from Laura, and then I'll give it back to you to sum up. Thanks. A lot of the talks we've heard have, have talked about the intersection between innovation and entrepreneurs. And as we know, public health is not a big money-making venture. If you go online and you're, you know, you're looking for a pair of shoes, next time you go online, there's all these ads for shoes. How do we advance and promote drivers to, for example, move public service announcements to an internet em environment? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question yeah. because our sister organization, the Skoll Foundation, has for the past 10 years been building this field of social entrepreneurship precisely to find ways of marketing public goods without the hope or uh, intention of there being any profit at all. And um, every year we have a, a meeting in Oxford, usually in April, and, and I get to watch 2,000 people come who are working on putting in toilets in Orisa 
stopping female genital mutilation in Senegal, working uh, with the uh, FDA or with any government agency to improve the way corporations are, are forced to disclose their risks that are against perhaps public health. Um, I think this is a time where public health needs to become more social entrepreneurial. And we've always had a problem in the field of social entrepreneurship. It almost exclusively comes out of the NGO sector. It comes out of civil society. Very difficult to find social entrepreneurs who come out of the government. This is the time we've got to find a way to bridge that gap because public health, by definition and by nature, is so frequently government oriented. We need to find a way to find a way to have the equivalent of intrapreneurs, corporations that have intrapreneurs inside of there. We need to have government public health intrapreneurs. And you should come see me afterwards and we'll see if we can't make that a, a conversation that we have with our, our sister organization because I think it's, that's really ripe for growth. You know, I think that we are also very bad at sharing the mission and I speak as a doctor. Um, you know, in my, in my field we've done everything we can to make health mystical and so that the average person leaves our office and hasn't got a clue what they actually had or what, you know, what they should do about it. And I think that we have to take that responsibility and say that's, that's terrible. I mean, we really need to share the mission because people jump in when you do that. And I've been really astounded at some of the very corporate kinds of folks who just really get this mission and really take off with this mission. So we sometimes make the mistake of saying, well, that person's over there making all that money. They couldn't be less interested in helping people. Because actually, that's not true. So I think a lot of it is on us to make our mission transparent and welcome people into it. And then I think we'll see a lot more movement. So I said when we started that uh, I would happily sit up here and talk for hours. And I know you feel the same way. Um, but we have to stop. So thank you all for listening. Please thank these two fantastic people.